All right, here we go. Welcome back to Golf Subpar, and welcome to a new studio if you're watching on YouTube. How about this little setup we got here? How about this? This is the first time we're coming in here. It doesn't look like we're going to meet about uh, accounts receivables or HR or something along those lines. And good news for everyone, no more hand banging on the table when yes. guys are making points that just shocks the world basically yeah. so how about this little setup we got special here? shout out to tammy larry mark for getting this whole thing together it looks fantastic i'm very excited to be in here but let's get to the genesis invitational what a week Ooh. it was hideki matsuyama little final round 62 to blow the field away sleaze i was out there covering the event for cbs walking with will zalatoris and luke list the next to last group there on sunday at one point, looked like Luke List was going to run away with this thing. Then we had five guys tied for the lead with anywhere from five to seven holes to play. Then in a blink of an eye, the damn thing was over. Yeah, it was a weird. There, there's a lot of shit going on at uh, in L.A. this week. But yeah, starting the day, I kind of thought I was like, I feel like Cantlay kind of just milks this thing, puts it to bed. I don't see him messing up very often. He's got a nice pairing with Xander. That whole group really didn't do anything the entire front nine. And then, like you said, Luke looked like the world beater. I was like, this is going to be Luke's. Then it could have been anyone's, and then, oh, this thing's done quickly with Hideki's final round. And, I mean, dude, what a final round it was. He gave us a little, you know, standard prototype Hideki on 16 where he was like, there was still some chance for some guys to make a late move on that. He gets to the par 3, 16th, hits it. Shot tracker shows it going a little, maybe weak right. You know, his follow-through drops to his shoulder, all that sort of thing. Like, oh, it's going in the bunker. This is going to open things up. Lands on, goes to four inches over you could just never know with Hideki's follow-through but dude what a final round that was good to see him back playing good golf but I mean dude like the stories that rocked the thing didn't even take place from the winner more or less it was Jordan Spieth's DQ which I'm sure we're going to get into in a second and then Tiger you know all the hoopla around him making his return and it was uh short-lived with the WD yeah but Hideki ninth PGA Tour win first since the Sony Open in 2022 has been battling some injuries he's actually been going back and forth to japan quite a bit to get treatment for his neck and other injuries but which is which is wild to me but man he is a world-class player he's a master's champion look at the places he's won riviera augusta national firestone i mean the guy wins at big time golf courses big time events he's won the wm phoenix open twice in front of the most raucous crowd there is on the pga tour he's not scared of the big moment and good to see him back healthy and playing good because, I mean, he is one of the, in my opinion, top 10 players in the world. Yeah, when he's playing well, when he's healthy, look at the, like you mentioned, look at the places he's won. And just like Tita Green, I mean, when he's going, he's tough to beat. It's just more or less around the greens, especially on the greens. We saw him tinker with his putting setup so many times over the years. But when it's all clicking, like he's tough to beat. And it's been a minute since we've seen him in that winner's circle. But uh, damn, I mean, damn if he didn't earn it. When they flash that thing up on the screen, like chance to tie the course record set by Ted Treba. I was like, wow, that is one with 500 names. Would not have guessed that uh, Ted was the course record holder at Riviera. Shout out Ted. Hell of a round, bud. 61 around 61 that around joint. Riviera. Getting it done. That Good pl plan. That place is so hard. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun to watch. The weather was pretty much perfect all week. Had hardly any wind except for Thursday when that afternoon wave played. Rather difficult. But Tiger Woods, obviously, is who we we're excited to see going in. Didn't look too bad on Thursday. Looked pretty good. Fired a little one over par. Didn't seem to hurt himself too bad. Then goes out Friday morning and just never looked right. You know, or sorry, Friday afternoon. Never looked right. Ended up playing six holes before WD with an illness, which is the good news in this thing. It, it seemed like nothing was wrong with the back. Yeah. I mean, I guess if there's a glass half full situation, that's it. It wasn't a back. It wasn't a foot. It wasn't any of that. It was flu, which seems like there was some weird shit going around, uh, around LA. But dude, Speaking of being sick, I was down for the count since Wednesday, doing nothing but watching TV. I actually watched Tiger's entire warm-up uh, on ESPN Live, and it started 54 minutes before he teed off. He's on the putting green and went through his entire deal, basically all eyes on Tiger. And just watching him warm-up, I was like, okay, I haven't seen Tiger's like pre-round warm-up from start to finish in a long time, but he was moving so slow, just around the putting green, hitting putts taking a while to gather him, scraping him back. Then he'd go sit down for a little bit, mess with his shoe, come back. And it just looked like he was so lethargic. And I was like, man, if he's able to like flip the switch by the time he gets on the first tee, like I'm going to be surprised. I don't know if this is what he's looked like the past few days, but he looks like he's moving slow. And then, yeah, sure enough, something was up with him. And, um, you know, he ends up withdrawing. But uh, the, the first round, I thought, he, uh, all things considered, I thought he looked as good as I could have hoped for 
more or less. There's going to be some rust on the game, but off the tee, irons. I thought his putter looked really good. He holds some nice putts. Um, golf game-wise, I thought it looked pretty good from what I saw. You were out there. You watched him during the Pro-Am in person. What did you think? I walked nine holes with him during the Pro-Am on Wednesday morning, the front nine. He looked so happy, so relaxed. He was playing with Josh Allen and Aaron Hicks, both who ridic- are unbelievable. They smash it. But Josh Allen got the call a week ago, asked if he'd want to play. He's like, absolutely. He's a golf nut. But I got a chance to spend on the fourth tee. We had about 10, 15 minutes. Takes a little while to play that hole. He was as talkative with me as he's ever been. Um, seemed really happy. Was making fun of Taylor Montgomery, which I always enjoy. Friendly have, waters. Friendly we, waters. We have that in common. Mm-hmm. Um, was joking how he's put in like a three iron that has a little more meat behind it. He goes, I'm getting older. I can't hit the three iron as high as I used to. Steps up on the holes, 233 yards. It's this beautiful high fade three iron. Catches the slope, goes down to like four feet. I'm like, yeah, that, that yeah, seems to work. Good club. Good club. But was walking great, swinging great. I was really looking forward to the week. I know he hasn't had that much success around Riviera. Two runner-up finishes, one of the few places he's never won. But I was so excited to see him get after it. And then, like you said, Thursday, I wasn't like, oh, my God, he looks incredible. No, or, but it was fine. Oh, he looks bad. It's like, yeah, he hadn't played in a while. Looks pretty good. I'm, I'm fine with what I'm seeing. And then just unfortunate to have what happened Friday. I thought it was a little dramatic with the ambulance and the two fire trucks outside the locker room. And then he gets in his own car and goes away. <laughs> the fire, the two, two fire trucks seemed like a little bit like overkill. I was like, uh tough shit to any neighbors around Riviera. They got a cat stuck in a tree or something like that. Sorry, all units are deployed to Riviera's clubhouse, but uh, that's Tiger Woods. And when something happens, by God, uh, everyone responds. But hopefully he gets over this flu and it's nothing physical and we can still see him, you know, once, maybe twice more before Augusta National because ultimately if we want him to have any sort of, play any sort of a role, he's got to log some like full tournaments. It can't just be one-offs here and there and then wds and things like that i I hope we get him for bay hill for me i'm even getting to the point where yes i would love for him to win love for him to get another major championship but just him being there being in the mix the buzz in the crowd it's so much different than when he's not there so like yeah i want him to win obviously but if he can just be there and consistently play whether it's once a month every other month i don't know Things are just so much better when Tiger Woods is in the field. Oh, without question. I mean, like if he shows up at the Masters and can play the weekend and just be, he doesn't have to be leading on the front page of the leaderboard, just anything, just be around. It makes that tournament better. Like personally, I think the stars would have to align for him to contend and possibly pick off any sort of a uh, PGA Tour event, much less a major, but just have him be there, have him play a factor. Cause like the golf, when it is health, when he is healthy and he's out there walking around, like it, it can be good enough. Uh, he's not as long as he used to be, sure, but he's long enough. And his iron play Pretty and his long. putter are ultimately what's going to win him a golf tournament. So um, that just, yeah, it was a little disappointing with all the buildup to see him only there as short as he was. But he was back and, you know, shit, you rewind a year ago, we didn't even know if we'd, we'd see that. So glass half full, I guess. Yeah, the other story of the week, Jordan Spieth getting yeah. DQ'd for an incorrect scorecard. His playing partner, Tom Kim, wrote down that he made a three on the par three fourth when he actually made a four. Jordan, who was also dealing with some illness, um, had yeah. a little bathroom emergency come on, rushed up the stairs, went in, signed a scorecard quickly. Well, didn't realize it was incorrect. By that point, it was too late. He was already out of the scoring area, came back, incorrect scorecard, which means DQ. Okay, I got a couple problems with this. This rule's been in place for a very long time, and I understand it before technology, before TV, before every eyeball in the world was able to watch golf and know exactly what you shot. If you're in a PGA Tour event, Sleaze, and I'm in Thailand, I can look and be like, yep, you shot. Sleaze is eight under. Eight under. Perfect. Eight under 64. Through six. Okay. No matter what, you got people out there keeping score everywhere. But the problem I have with this, okay, if he would have signed, if there would have been a five written down when he made a four, no big deal. We just add a stroke to his score. He tees it up the next two days. But because he signed for one lower, it's automatic disqualification because he left the scoring area. Now, now if he'd have been sitting there, they'd have been like, Jordan, you, this is wrong. We have you as a four. You have a three right down. He'd been like, yes, you're right. My bad. I missed that. Fix that. Okay, no big deal. But even though he left the scoring area, I think the, the punishment does not fit the crime here because the fact that he is DQ'd for signing for one lower when it was an obvious mistake, he did not mean to do it, instead of just a two-shot penalty. So I use the example of improving your lie. You can move sand from behind your ball to help your lie, whatever it is, and you deny it, deny it, deny it, and then you come back and you're like, you know what? I did it. You're, you're right. Two-shot penalty. Continue play on. But this dude made a simple little mistake where his scorecard wasn't 100% correct, and instead of just being able to go back and fix it and take a penalty, like I think he should be penalized because he signed it and he left, 
the fact that he's disqualified, I just think is so harsh. Like what others have done, improving their life, moving their ball, whatever it is, is way worse than what Jordan Spieth did. You could tee off with 15 clubs and play a few holes and still go around and tee off the next day. You're not disqualified for it. And I think two things can be true at once. One, of course, the rules in place. It's up to Jordan Spieth to have the right scores on the card. He signed for it. Boom. That is what it is. Also, it can still be a shit rule. Like, dude, I think there has to be a line. There's got to be some common sense, some sort of logic. Like, there's a difference between cheating and gaining an advantage on the field versus, like, an innocent accounting mistake, especially when the dude, as soon as he finished on 18, by the way, sprinted up the stairs, uh, got up there. He was in a dire situation. He had a poopy pants scenario here. What do you want me to do? Sit here and wait and possibly shit myself before my presser? Or can I just leave and we can figure this thing out when I get back? It's just... It's just a bad look. I think the rule's antiquated. There's so much technology out there. It's like at the end of the day, a guy signs for a wrong scorecard. That's a simple accounting error. He wasn't trying to gain anything. And the fact that he didn't get to play the rest of the week, it's a huge blow to the Genesis, too. To lose Tiger and Jordan back-to-back mm -hmm. -back within the span of a few hours, tough blow for them. At some level, I'm sure in the junior golf, you know, amateur golf world, there's some sketchy stuff going on with, like, scorecard signing and things like that. At the PJ Tour level... You can't cheat and be like, oh, I actually made a three there, not a four. Well, like, it's not cheating, so let's figure out a way to at least let guys continue the golf tournament. Whether it's a one-shot penalty, two-shot penalty, or just fix it before you tee off. Something along those lines is better than disqualification. Yeah, I don't think there's ever a point where Jordan would be like, no, I actually made a three there. And everybody's group's like, no, man, you made it a four. Like, that's not what's happening here. It's like, yes, I was in a very big hurry. I made a mistake. That's on me. Give me a two-shot penalty, one-shot penalty, whatever it is. They're, I'm fine with giving a penalty because part of it is you have to sign a correct scorecard. I, I totally get that. But disqualification is way too harsh. Way too harsh. And, it's, yeah, like all the other rules and fractions out there, you can take an illegal drop, and as long as you catch it before you sign your card, boom, you just get, you're not even playing from the right spot, and you still get to keep playing the tournament. This is just like there's a difference between cheating and having like a mental hiccup. And this is a mental hiccup in a situation where he needed to get the hell out of the scoring tent and get away for a minute. And that ends up costing him a disqualification. It's just, I think it's a bad look for golf when people tune in. They're like, oh, dude, why is Jordan Speed disqualified? And they hear the rule. They're like, what? No. Like, no one, no other sport or the competitor is responsible for keeping track of the score. Just to defend the rules officials here, because we had them on with CBS and I talked to a lot of them throughout the week. If he would have said, which, listen, he was, his mind was going a million miles an hour. He had to go. Emergency. Yes. If he would have said, guys, I'll be right back, there would have been no problem. But because he said, are we good? And they said, yeah. And he left the area. Like, there's a little certain area you have to stay within. Um, he was That's the common and sense I just, thing. I don't like it. It's like he can't come back from that and be like, hey, dude, there's a little, little uh, oopsie here on the card. Can you clear this up? Oh, yeah, dude. I actually made four there. Cool. Done. And it's over. No one even needed to, like, know about it. It was just a different situation. But to make it result in a disqualification he was playing pretty decent like who's to know what jordan speed oh, could go was, out and do yeah. on the weekend like it could it could potentially it, it may not have but it could change the outcome of the golf tournament like it's just a bad look and another one of those rules like luckily it doesn't come into play very often at the pga tour level you don't see that too often most guys just camp out in that tent until they clear it 17 times and then they leave but it happened so I think it's probably worth addressing going forward and the fact that it happened to jordan speed at this golf tournament probably increases the chances that it gets changed uh, at some point. My favorite part of that whole situation is when our man Deuce had to come on and kind of break it all down for you. And he said, our scoring area this week is the ladies locker room. Ah, <laughs> nice. And who better to explain the situation than a guy named Deuce? You know what I mean? You got you. Mm -hmm. If there's anyone that can explain what happened there, but a let's, dude named let's Deuce. change that. We got to get that rule out of here. Like I'm fine with the penalty, just disqualification is a little harsh in my opinion without question but the genesis genesis invitational was fantastic hideki matsuyama very deserving winner ninth pga tour win now the most wins by an asian born player passing the one the only kj Choi. beautiful the beautiful right. kj Choi, one of the great cutters of the golf ball in the world and on a side note not on the winner's side but shout out will zalator yes. coming back in just his fourth start now as a runner-up he finished uh top 15 at tory as well he made the putter switch which is it looks miles different from six feet. And then I know there's a little bit of a toe hit there, but it looks like night and day compared to what he used to have. The fact that he's come back from that type of an entry uh, as quickly as he has, dude, it's awesome. And like sky's the limit for that kid. This is not breaking news by any means, but I think the fact that he's gotten back to this form as quickly as he has is pretty damn impressive. It really was. He, I followed him on Sunday. The ball striking's there. The putter is much better. 
Um, there's a reason he has three runner ups and nine major starts. He's built for big time golf courses. Riviera is one of those. And it's good to see him back. He feels great, moving great. Um, I'm looking for big things for Wills Altor. It's just his fourth start back. Um, to have that surgery at such a young age, great to see him back. And it was a great week at the Genesis. I will say, though, that LA traffic can kiss my ass. Um, the prices also can do the same. Other mm-hmm. than that, it was a great week. Anything that can't kiss your ass from LA. Bel Air Country just Club, the whole place. place is fantastic. Okay, cool. Keep that. Love that place. Start the rest from scratch. Yeah? I, I mean, I, I was trying to break even last week between my paycheck and going out to dinner at night. It ain't no joke. You got an extra stamp okay. in your passport, though. You crossed the border. Good job. <laughs> Colin Morikawa, who is a massive foodie, okay? He knows all the great spots. He's giving me a hard time because I, I've heard of Mr. Chow's there in L.A. I've never been before. Natalie and I were walking around looking for a place to eat. Stumbled upon Mr. Chow's. I've always heard this place is great. A little touristy. Whatever. No big deal. It's been a staple in Beverly Hills. Walked in, was able to get a table. One of the best meals I've ever had. He's like, you're such a tourist. I'm like, dude, I don't know how long's the last time you've been yeah, there. I am a tourist. Place is unbelievable. A local who I played golf with the next day. I said, I went to Mr. Chow's last night. One, seriously, one of the best meals. Noodles. They had this fiery beef, and they're known for their duck. Duck was unbelievable. And he goes, I haven't been there in years. Went the other night, and it was it blew me away how good it was. So if you're ever in in Beverly Hills, I highly recommend going to Mr. Chow's. It's gonna cost you a lot. Bring your wallet, but it's worth it. Bring Nancy's wallet. Better off because it's fat. Fat wallet. Did you know that? You like that one? Yeah, I did like that one. Nancy didn't know where to go. That was like a compliment dig. This is the best one. Get that fatter like Nancy's compl- wallet. Yeah, I'm complimenting you, dude. I'm saying you're rich. It's the first time I think I've ever heard Jim Nance speechless. Yeah, he just went straight to a read. <laughs> he's like, all right, but speaking of. Hey, that's that's one of the, my goals in life. I got Jim Nance to be speechless. I never thought that would happen. Tough to do. Speaking of going straight to reads. Show us how it's done. This is what you do, Jimmy boy. No matter where your next adventure takes you, the Genesis GV80 is up for it. Featuring stunning design, a wide range of intuitive technology, and impeccable performance, the GV80 will ensure every drive will be an unforgettable one. The GV80 handles all types of terrain with standard all-wheel drive and available electronic limited slip differential. The GV80's navigation system with 14.5 HD screens seamlessly integrates smartphone connectivity and cloud technology for faster and more accurate routing. The GV80's spacious cabin features customizable ambient lighting, Genesis, proud sponsor of the Genesis Invitational. Make the game your own. The Genesis GV80. Learn more at Genesis.com. You were in one of those bad boys this week. By the way, shout out Will Zalatoris. Picked himself up one of these GV80s and a GV70 for his caddy, which he said also, I'm giving the caddy mine as well. What a freaking oh, guy. both of them? Yeah, he's just... He's, I thought... That's, it, that's, that's, that's on, a I think dude. you might want to fact check yourself on that one. I, I was told the GV70 is more expensive because it was electric. And he asked if he'd be trading, and he said, no, he's giving him the more expensive one. Oh, maybe I did just, not hear he was giving him both of them. Oh, well, I thought he said, he, oh, maybe he just said, I'll give him the better one, whatever, the one's the more expensive. But well, either all, way, his boy's walking away with a new whip. Shout out to Willie Z. Can I say one more thing about Will's Al Torres that I appreciate? Switch to the broomstick putter, putting phenomenally with it. Also, of all the guys that put with the broomstick out there on all the different tours, he's the one guy, when you look at him, you could, you could fit a, damn near a football in between the butt of the club and his chest. There is zero debate whether or not he's anchoring it. I appreciate that about you, Will Zalatoris. Yeah. Shout out to you. But back to Genesis real quick before we finish. They were nice enough to give all of us at CBS a courtesy car for the week. Did you trash it? I had the GV70, the electric one. Fantastic ride. Fast? Yeah. Get well, you from you stoplight really to stoplight? How does it go from zero to 15? Zero to 25 and then stops and on then a dime. Stops. Yeah, that's a beautiful whip. That's but it was a great need. week out of the Genesis thing. Thanks to them for everything that they do. Let's get to our guest this week. One of our favorites, the Aussie U.S. Open champ, Jeff Ogilvie, joins us in the house. This is a fantastic one. Let's get to it. Here's Jeff Ogilvie on Subpar. All right. At long last, the time has finally come to sit down with one of the great minds in the game of golf. Eight-time PGA Tour winner. Major champion. Now becoming a highly regarded member of the golf course architecture world. The great Jeff Ogilvy is with us. Good on you, Mike. Thank you. There Thanks for having me. Yeah, there it is. He had it, to get those. I, did, I can't. It's like a. It's like a. It's a nervous twitch. I have to just throw it in there. Anytime. Probably never heard it before either. No, I've heard you do it. Pretty cool. It's pretty it's nice, a, isn't it? It's almost. It's right. Yeah. I can mingle down there. Yeah, maybe a little bit. With the might be. Yeah. I haven't uh, seen you since I was down in your homeland a few months ago in Australia. We got to tee it up together down at your place, Victoria. We did. Nice, we did. beautiful summer day. Yeah. Wow. Well, Melbourne's rough. Um, it was tough when you were down there, but I just got back. I was there till 
Yeah, like mid-Jan, just got back. What Good to place. have you back too, by the way. It's nice to be here. Feels right that you're back mm-hmm. in the great city of Scottsdale. I heard the game. We didn't get to play this past week, but I've been hearing word on the street. Game's clean right now, huh? It Wanna feels all right. It? Yeah, it feels all right. I don't know. Golf is weird, but it is uh, weird. You're flushing it. That's weird. <laughs> no, you know what you're weird. not going to believe is tempo. Pretty good. Pretty good still. <laughs> yeah. Can, not- we, can we talk? Because that was my first time down to Australia. I played with you at Victoria and then over at Kingston Heath, which I believe your company had a little something to do with, touching it up. And it is unbelievable, both places. But just the golf down there. like It is unbelievable. Why can we not have places like that over here? I don't know, like, it's pretty unique, isn't it, really? like It's, it's so not, cool. It's not Lynx Golf, it's not Parkland Golf, it's somewhere in the middle. I don't know, it's just a unique terrain. Melbourne, I mean, nowhere else in Australia has golf like that. I mean, Adelaide a little bit. Um, but I don't know, we just got lucky. Good land, they all built them on the good spots. Alston McKenzie was out there right at the right time, set like a really good culture about it. I don't know, and they set them up great yeah but you know? like the the bunkers to the edge of the greens i just love the way it's cut and shaved around there and like my wife natalie was down there and she's like should i come to the course i heard it's beautiful i'm like you wouldn't appreciate like royal melbourne because you're not a golfer like it's not the prettiest thing in the world but as a golfer you're like holy shit this place is really cool royal melbourne's pretty special yeah i'm glad you got to see it being played properly and they got tough weather that week too that was the third round was insane i mean you were out there you said the kid shot 65 sleaze is kryptonite samson no samson that Dirty bastard. He's good, isn't <laughs> yeah, he? No, he's really good, isn't God, he? God, you see why we lost that, dude? He's a freaking machine. Yeah, that was one of the best scores you'll ever see. Um, I don't know. Royal's just special. It's not long at all. There's really only one real par five. But if you break 70, you're playing proper golf. Yeah, 6,900 yards. Yeah, with no real rough. Um, just big greens, slopey greens, really wide fairways. But if you miss it in the wrong spot, good luck. It's just it's- so cool down there, too, like that area. I mean, you can play so many great courses. They're all within, like, 10 miles of each other. They're all right there. Yeah. Royal Melbourne, Victoria, Kingston Heath, Commonwealth, Yarra Yarra, Woodlands, Peninsula Kingswood. They're all 10, 15 minutes away from each other. They're all, you could drop a blanket over them. Yeah. That's my dream. Them. My dream golf trip that I've never done is go down there and play those. Like, you know, you can go, I've been to Monterey and you can play that. Those are all in an area. Long Island has some spectacular golf up there in a very close area, but like that one, they're just different. They're just, you don't get them in the States, like you were saying. Yeah, it's pretty special. I mean, I think Westchester, Westchester County is pretty strong. You know, Monterey is yeah. pretty strong. Southampton, it's not bad. Yeah. It's pretty good golf. But it's probably the best collection of courses for everybody to play. I mean, some of these really, really great courses are difficult, aren't they? I mean, Royal Melbourne's tough, but anybody can play it. Oh, yeah. You know, you can play it along the ground. You can run it onto every green. There's no water. Um, I think the 18 handicapper probably breaks his handicap and the scratch handicapper wonders why he can't break par, you know? So it's a really kind of, I don't know, unique golf. It was set up great for our man, Charlie V. Just, <laughs> yeah, just keep it on the ground. Yeah. 70 yards, <laughs> give me the putter. <laughs> Breaks 12 yards left to right. What is it? Is there anything about the terrain and things like that? Because so many Aussies that come up from there have the best set of hands. You're in that category. I think you're one of the most beautiful pitchers of the ball. Jason Day, uh, Cam Smith. I mean, you can kind of go down the list. Is that just something like playing on that terrain? You learn to use the bounce. It just feels like everyone that comes from there pitches it beautifully yeah i think so i think firm really really firm greens i mean then they're never soft enough to even make a pitch mark to be fair i mean they're all really really firm the bunkers at first are an acquired taste because there's there's variety there's firm spots and soft spots and you never really know what's underneath the ball but when you grow up there you begin to learn how to read it it teaches you how to read a lie in a bunker it's not just, it's not the same under everyone. You begin to learn how to use your feet and feel like, well, there's probably no sand under this one or there's lots of sand under this one. So you you learn how to adapt and you have to be good. If you're not good around the greens there, you're just not going to do any good because they're so fast and they're so firm. Um, you got to spin the ball a lot because the, the greens aren't going to stop. So I don't know. I mean, firm ground, short grass. I think growing up on short yeah. grass, chipping, I think is much, you can go from short grass to long grass. But it's hard to grow up in rough and then learn how to chip on short grass. It terrifies people, yeah. It blows me away how many tour players don't love chipping off short grass, which is amazing to me. Um, but if you don't grow up on it, it's a different... You've, you're, it's a very exacting technique. If your technique's not spot on, you're just not going to get it done on short grass. Those, those bunkers, the, the average guy played ping pong back and forth across those things down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you want to... You want to be a good bunker player. And half the time, the right bunker shot isn't straight at the hole. It's it's a bit Augusta-like. It's uh, you got to go over there. you got to go to the right. you got to go to the left. you gotta, you got to accept 15 feet's a good shot. 
uh, you try to hit it close, you'll hit it across the other side of the green sort of stuff. Well, right now, I mean, you're obviously still playing some. You got your design company, OCM, um, possibly some TV work. What are you focused on the most right now? Probably golf, actually. Um, the last few years, I haven't really known what I was doing. I mean, COVID, I was down in Australia, just so happened when COVID came and COVID, Australia was a bit like Alcatraz in COVID, <laughs> like we couldn't get off the island. Um, so I didn't play any golf really, but I spent most of last year here um, hanging out at Whisprock again, playing a bit more golf, played 12, 10 or 12 tournaments out on tour and sort of remember that this is a pretty good job. And I think, I mean, my game is still decent enough. I think I've got to get some opportunities, but um, I'm pretty mostly focused on golf while I can. I mean, I've probably only got a few years left on the big tour if I've got a chance. So I'm mainly focused on golf, but the OCM stuff would be the second thing. That's a really, that's a fun thing to get involved in um, with some really, really good partners. And we're starting to get some really, really cool jobs. So it's golf and then that. Yeah, let's stay on the golf for just a minute because you and I were texting last week. And you're like, dude, I'm, I'm a head down. I'm golf again after a little break, right? And you came back last year and started playing. But what was it that got the juices flowing? Did you miss like the locker room, being with the fellas? Was it the competition? What was it? I mean, all of that really. I mean, the locker room's fun. I mean, I could do without the travel so much. Yeah. <laughs> but the locker room's fun. Just the grind. I don't know. Like every day I'd woken up since I was about 15, it was, I didn't have to decide what to do. It was just how do I get better at golf? You know, there's like a guiding light that just, you just go that direction your whole life. And all of a sudden for a couple of years there, I'd wake up in the morning. I didn't know what to do. I just sat around and watched TV and <laughs> played video games. <laughs> Play video games. Like, yeah. You know, just the, what do you do? And I just, it wasn't that, it sounds kind of fun to just sit around and play video games and do nothing, but it isn't really. It's kind of nice to have something to aim at. So it's more that than anything. And the contention, like being in the President's Cup last year, um, there's some pretty special environments, those tournaments, and sort of being, not playing, but being inside the ropes with Scotty and Cam, especially they finished around off really well on the, I think the Saturday, finished Eagle Birdie Birdie. And just the environment, um, see we're beating JT, like just that, I miss that, you know, and I'm probably never going to get back to that, but I mean, you never know. And it's um, just nice to be around. And I miss that. Just a chance to be in the mix again. I think the, the real drug for me, I think is the mix, you know, um, it's fun Feeling to take, something. it's fun to take a hundred off you boys down the last hole at Wisbrock, but it's like, okay. it's a little different. <laughs> that gets you ready we can when all you're dream. out there. <laughs> we can all that dream. Gets you ready. <laughs> but you're 46 years old now, 47 this year. There's another fella that's going to turn 50 before you. That PJ Tour champions might get rather interesting if he decides to play out there some. Absolutely. I mean, I I feel like he, well, he can take a cart. So that although I I hear that his walking is much improved since the mm -hmm. operation on his ankle. Um, but if he can take a cart and play a bunch of tournaments, I mean, that's going to boost the seniors tour a lot. I would have thought champions tour. Sorry, um, and that'll be fun to play against him again. Like get in the mix there again. Um, Exciting. 15th. And no, nobody you talk to, out of all the guys we all talk to, everyone who plays the Champions Tour has a good time. They everyone. all they all have a fun time. All and of a sudden, all... there'll be $15 million purses on the Champions Tour. Yeah, who knows with where golf's at at the moment. I mean, um, the world still wants to see him play. And if he's out there playing and he's got... I mean, he's never changed. He's a golf tragic. He's. I'm sure he's probably got Nicholas's records and Langer's records up on the wall. Like eyeing him off, thinking, "Well, maybe well, I can get some of this done." Like, you know, that's how he operates. I like. I mean, he's a that. yeah, that's he's right. a, he's a golf freak. There's no doubt. But stay on him a little bit because I mean, you played right in the heart of his prime. I mean, you were number three in the world at one point. You got paired with him a lot, I believe. The PJ at Medina, which you just helped redo. You was was it you, Phil, and him? Yeah. The first two days. I mean, you were right there. What was nice. it like going through Tiger Woods in his prime? Because everybody's like nowadays, like God, I wish I would have seen Tiger. I wish I'd have played against Tiger in his prime. I'm like, no, you didn't. You don't, you don't want any part of that. No, I don't know if you did. Well, I mean, you did for the experience, yes. but not because you thought you weren't going to beat him. No one was going to beat him. I don't know. He was special. I mean, we were basically the same age. He was, yeah, he's 18 months older, I think. Um, and we were kids in Australia. And we, when he played LA in 1991, he was like 15 or 16, he got an invite. And um, the announcers were talking about, oh, this kid's going to be great and isn't it great? And I'm like, wow, yeah, he can't be that good. He can't be as good as me or a couple of my other <laughs> friends. And, you know what I mean? Like, He's all right. And then when I got over, I, the first time I saw him play for real was at the Western at Pointer Woods. Mm, what a place. Sort of mid-90s. And we were all bouncing three woods 
like bouncing drivers into the trees at the end of the range. He was flying three woods up the top of these trees. So he was hitting at 30 yards past us and I'd never seen anything like it. And he, he didn't win. I think Cryball beat him that week in the match play. But I'm just like, this guy's a whole nother level. And then about a month later, about it, the next year I saw him play at the British Open. Stevie Allen, you know Stevie oh, Allen? Oh, one of he the, quali yeah. He'd qualified and I didn't qualify, but I got his family ticket. So I was sort of walking around, had really good access at Lytham 96 and um, watched Tiger shit 65 or 66 in the third round. I'm like, yeah, this kid's different. He was different. And then I played with him a whole, a whole bunch. I mean, that day at um, Madonna... 2006 PGA with him and Phil. That was the first time they'd ever played together in a major, mm -hmm. which was hard to believe, I guess, at that point. But I guess they'd just never paired them together. And it was just pandemonium. It I was, mean, how many people were following that? There had to be nobody else on the golf course. Yeah, that's why they put them in separate waves. Why I never played Thursday, Friday, because like, we need TV. We need one of them on each side. I mean, there was 300 people inside the ropes, at, at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just nuts. Anyone with a credential was inside the ropes. And I got into lunch, I think, the first day. And I can't remember who I was just sat down at a table as you do and I'm having lunch and someone's like, this is a weird major. There's no one here. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is the biggest crowd How in the, the world. You been? Yeah. But the other side of the golf course, there was nobody. The whole, the whole tournament was watching one group. It was, um, it was amazing. And of course, Tiger, every single time there was high expectations, he'd go and do well. So he goes and wins the tournament. Um, that to me was the best. I mean, we've, we've all played with, I mean, guys like DJ and Brooks and scotty and sergio and these guys who can play outrageous golf it's just like wow this is a really high level but tiger every time the expectations were high he met them or exceeded them every single time never didn't exceed expectations and it's just i don't know how you do that because that's the biggest anchor in golf is your own expectations right you just beat it every time Incredible. and when he's in contention like that i mean it's so hard to close out a golf tournament he did it like virtually every time they had held a lead he was a genius was at finishing 72 holes in front of everyone else. I mean, Thursday, Friday, he was pretty casual and you'd be talking. It was like a normal Thursday, Friday with anyone else. Saturday, he'd be a little bit more serious. And Sunday, you couldn't talk to him. Like, he just wouldn't even look anyone in the eye. He was almost meditating. You know, he was just walking really slow, really measured. And he just somehow knew how to get to the end in front of everyone else. He was just better at it than everyone else. That was going to be my question. Like, you mentioned Thursday, Friday. Like, he was talking and stuff going down the fairways. Like... What do you talk to Tiger Woods about during a round? Uh, I mean, him and Stevie usually usually had some pretty weak jokes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just normal banter. What are you doing? And we actually had kids about the same time. Um, my kids are about the same age as Tiger. So after, after a while, that was right around when we were having kids, 2006. Um, we just, we would check in and see how the kids were going. And, you know, normal, normal stuff. But, like playing with him, obviously, in that arena, it's just a whole nother level like i got to cover him for the first time last year at la and walking with him just covering him in the media side it's just it nobody else has to deal with the stuff he has to deal with like for you as a player it's got to be awesome to play with him but at the same time you're like god there is so much shit going on right now compared to when i play with other people oh yeah it was that it was just incredible like just the people like you the people inside the ropes as i said was trying to make room on some small tees at riviera for all the people who want to be inside the ropes um and there's just noise going on i always felt i liked playing with him i always played well with him why not always but mostly played pretty well the group in front of him is the worst spot yeah by a long way because everyone's rushing to try to get a view of tiger woods and they're all rushing to the group in front um that's the worst spot always the group in front but with him with him was just fun it was inspiring you knew you were with like the best player of all time or one of the best players of all time um comparing your game to his, or not really comparing your game to his, but seeing what you could learn and pick up. And you were kind of hoping that he would do something Tiger Woods in front of you. So you were like there. I was there when he did this, yeah. you know. Um, no, I was very lucky. I think everyone, I mean, you don't, you didn't want any part of it, really, but we're all pretty fortunate to play in that era, you know, to play with a guy that good, sort of maybe the best ever, um, pretty special. And just the stuff he would come up with, he could be playing rubbish all day, but he would always hit the important shot well. Like if you were at the Masters, he'd be playing rubbish all day, but he'd miss every fairway, but then he'd pipe one down 15, hit it to eight feet and make eagle and fix his round. You know, he just never missed the shot that mattered, you know? Oh, that's cool. Plenty of people hit good shots and bad shots, but he just somehow hit the ones that would really make the most effect on his score. He always hit a good shot. Yeah, and he's, hopefully we get to see him sooner rather than later. I don't really care what he shoots. Just to have him out, at a golf course on a on a golf course is going to be awesome. But in your comeback, as you're, I don't want to call it comeback, but as you're, you know, kind of redevoting yourself to golf right now with the, 
youth and the speed movement and everybody's in at 180 plus ball speed when when you're working on your game are you doing anything different than you used to like are you chasing that at all or are you just like no i want to tighten up what i do not really um i just want to tighten up what i do i mean i'm still i don't think i ever really worked out my own golf to the level i wanted to you know you've always got some itch to scratch you know i wish i could do this or i wish i could do that just trying to tidy up that i'm fortunate that i've always hit it far enough i mean i'm not with these kids these days but i mean i'm still in the uh, mid 170s or something so i'm hitting it far enough you know um and whenever i've chased speed in the past things have kind of gone wrong so i mean i'm going to the gym a little bit and hitting a few balls and just trying to hit it better you know i think there's this it's a little overrated the distance a little bit um it's talked about and it's all anyone wants to do and everyone talks about their new driver or the new ball or the speed stick routine they've done in the winter and I'm hitting it 15 yards further. Um, it's still the guy who gets it in the hole in the least amount of shots and you don't need to hit it 330 yards to to shoot whatever, 14 under at Torrey last week. You don't. Even that's the longest course in the world and you can still, I mean, the winner wasn't hitting it 330. No, he wasn't. I mean, you know, So you can still win a bunch yeah. of tournaments doing that. I um, mean, it's not very long ago that Jordan was the best player in the world and he's not, he wasn't in that dominant. So I still just try to do what I do well better. All right, some big news here from Subpar. We have officially launched our own YouTube page. Make sure to subscribe at golf underscore subpar on YouTube. Check out this week's video. Uh, like, subscribe, do all the stuff. Colt, we got some cool behind the scenes stuff coming and uh, give you a little outside look at some of the stuff outside the studio. So. Please like, please subscribe. You're the best listeners in the game. We love you. Back to the show. What's your thoughts on like the direction the game has gone? I mean, like I said, you're number three in the world. I mean, you were one of the best on the planet. And now, like you said, it's it's very distance biased. Uh, I mean, and you're obviously in the golf course design business. So you're building these places to kind of handle the modern game. But with, are you a fan of distance being so important, the ball not spinning as much and all that? I mean, it feels like on the PGA Tour most weeks, like there's not really that much rough. So guys just ship it down there. There's not as much strategy, I would say, compared to when you were playing as like at a consistent level. No, I mean, the tour had a few phases through our career. I mean, it was sort of like it is now when I first, it like late 90s, early 2000s. And then they went a long, rough, narrow fairway phase where it was just hack out every week. Mm -hmm. And that was really frustrating. I didn't really like that. And now they seems to have gone back. It's like they just let you hit it anywhere as long as you hit it far. Um, I don't know. I think f as soon as it gets firm, you find the best golfers usually. I would just much prefer sort of their main goal, getting it firm over any sort of formula. They seem to have some formulas. It's like, right, we have the fairways this wide this week. That's going to be this. And we have the rough at this length and all that. I mean, I think you saw Australia. It's not, there's no formula involved. It's just we don't water the rough. So the rough is dry and flyer and the greens are really firm so the rough is a real problem you can still get it there but flyers are a problem flyers get you in a lot more trouble than hack out absolutely you know i mean hack out and hack out's kind of boring and i don't think anyone wants to watch hack out you know um i would just if i if i had if i was the boss of the pga tour for agronomy department for a minute i wouldn't want to be the other boss um <laughs> why not <laughs> <laughs> um i would just aspire to have the greens as firm as possible because whenever they're firm i mean everyone's shooting 20 we go to mexico last year which is a great venue and an unbelievable course and the boys are shooting 28 under par and it's like eight thousand yards long you just can't make it long enough to do it lengthwise but then you go to colonial which they were basically killing because they were digging mm -hmm. it up the next day and it was single digits i think and then memorial was firm as anything and that was single digits it's like as soon as it gets firm you find the best golfer and you all of a sudden 330 in the rough is no good anymore maybe 270 on the right hand side of the fairway is a good spot because i can stop it on the green we've yeah, had years like medina when jt won there there was like the longest course i think at the time 78 plus or whatever but it was dead soaking wet ball stopped exactly where it lands if the ball stops where it lands like these dudes will torch it you can make it 8200 versus bouncy 7000 like you said at colonial last year when they're like that seems to be but it's hard to do you need a little cooperation from mother nature and things like that you do and it's not all it's you can't guarantee it for sure but i think if that's a direction that would be make distance less when you when you make it eight thousand yards all you do is make us want to go home and get our speed sticks out and go to the gym and like how far can we hit it but if we played colonial and memorial every week we would go home and work on our soft little half seven iron left to right shots and now chipping around the greens and we would work on different stuff um 
So yeah, I mean, it, it is. There's no perfect world, and I think a variety is the best too. I mean, you should have weeks where like the long guys really get an advantage, yeah, but course. you should have other weeks where the guys who can really shape the ball around and spin it get an advantage. Well, you said it perfectly. I mean, and you can't control Mother Nature. I mean, sometimes it's just it's soft. That's what it is. But like we've seen Hartford where 10, 11, 12 under par win. That's sixty eight hundred yards. I mean, Hilton heads hold up held up over time because when it gets firm. But I think you know with te- technology has changed it so much where. Tiger was obviously better than everybody, but he also could hit shots that other people couldn't. Like, you're a great long iron player. Like, hitting a five iron up in the air and getting it to stop was a huge skill. Well, now with the equipment, everybody pretty much can. And with track mans, it's like, if the ball's going to stop, these guys know that five iron flies 205. And they are so good at hitting their numbers. So it doesn't matter if they have 205 or 155, they can hit their number and then get the ball to stop. Yeah, I think golf gets the most interesting when the number is not that important you know when you're playing palm springs i mean i'm not picking on la quinta or the desert or anything like that but when you're playing in these soft no wind places 205 is 205 and you know you can hit it as soon as you hit it you're like well that's 202 or it's 207 you just know straight away whereas when you go to the old course or you go to the british open or you go to somewhere firm there's a little bit of a breeze all of a sudden you kind of the numbers just a starting point right you're just trying to feel it in and use your eyes and that's a bit more golf to me than just totally agree than just black and white numbers. i mean what scares players is not having control and when the ball's when the ground's firm and they have no control over what it's going to do that's when it it plays hard and i'm old too so i mean i think the firmer and the, <laughs> the firmer it gets i think the more experience gets an advantage you know i think these kids i think another reason why you see these kids come straight out of school and do well is because they're soft and they're you can learn these courses in a day and a half you know whereas at say raw melbourne say if we played at oh. raw melbourne I don't think there'd be college kids up there contending. You know, I think it would be Tiger and John Rahm and the best golfers in the world. I mean, the best golfers in the world would be up there because you have to be the best golfer in the world and you have to have had a bit of experience to be able to sort of work out how to get around there. Yeah, and you, like, from your career till now, like, it's been a big evolution in golf. From the speed we're talking about now, you got, like, the data, the analytics, the track man, like, just the instruction that guys have on a range on a given day. Like, everyone's got three guys around them and they're going through all of it. Where did you live? Because you have one of the most beautiful golf swings i would say it looks natural it doesn't look like there's a ton of technique where'd you live when you were playing your best golf in terms of instruction um i got a little bit um but i wasn't ever obsessed with it um when i did sort of get obsessed with it like we all go down those rabbit holes that, that usually went poorly um a little bit i just i do a little bit i think yeah, there's a massive advantage in having a different perspective an educated point of view from a coach um because sometimes we, we, I mean, golfers naturally, competitive people are naturally a little bit stubborn, I think, all of us, because that's kind of why we compete. We think we know all the answers all the time, and I think it's good to have a bit of help. And I, Dale Lynch was my coach for, for a really long time, and he was very wise, was fantastic to keep me sort of viewing it from a slightly different perspective than my own, you know, which I think was really good. Um, now, I think, it, I mean, it's nuts. They all swing it great. So it's clearly helping everyone all this stuff all this launch monitors and 3d pads 3d plates and all the all the stuff they don't even know all the stuff they do but like they all swing it great when they come out don't they all the young kids i mean when i got on tour you'd look up and down the range and there was two good swings and everyone else was trying to work it out you know now there's 75 good swings and there's a couple of guys it's like how are you still out here they're all you know? robots yeah yeah it's so it's clearly had a massive impact but you still don't generally see those guys up there at the end of those really, really important tournaments. You still, the cream still ends up at the top. And I think there's an element above that you can't ignore that sort of, uh, it's hard to describe what it is, but there's a sort of a psychological golf wisdom. There's a wisdom in there that can't be learned or can't be taught by someone. It can only be sort of learnt by experience and, feeling golf out a little bit and the very very best sort of seem to do both you know the technique and get that part right you know tiger was always very big on talking about his technique when he got interviewed but then you'd go and see him play and it was all art you know the way oh, he played yeah. you know he moved it every, he was every yeah, shot one of the few that were both like technically yeah. perfect but also an artist could hit whatever shot he wanted you know i mean and jordan's a little bit that way he seems to tie himself in technical knots but then he actually gets himself a really difficult shot and all of a sudden he becomes an artist again like I think there's somewhere in there that's the sweet spot. You know, you you really got to understand what you're doing, but you really have to let go at some point and let the athlete take over. Um, 
Yeah, it's fair. It's, it's that's why golf's so good. And I mean, you never there's no right answer. Yeah, like, it's fascinating to sort of work through all that. I think that's why Jordan's so successful around Augusta National because he just throws the technique out the window and he goes and he's an artist there. He doesn't think about he doesn't look at the greens book, which you're not allowed to have anymore. But that's one thing like him and his Mike his caddy Michael Greller would always talk about. He's like he uses the green book every week. He gets obsessed with it, and then we get to Augusta and they don't have him, and he puts his ass off. It's just like it's crazy. Like he just lets everything take over. I think yeah, Jordan's the sort of guy, and I think a lot of people are this way. If you ask them a really interesting question, they're going to come up with an interesting answer. And Augusta asks asks interesting questions all day. But if it's asking just a boring question, just hit it. Mm, yeah. just hit it down the fairway but to hit it down to here then it, it doesn't engage his mind and so he goes into his technique but if the shot engages his mind then he doesn't go that way that's that's yeah. really cool the way you said that like you ask an interesting question you're gonna get an interesting answer which leads me to tv are you gonna ask an interesting question right now i'm gonna ask you know what <laughs> because your name has been thrown out there a lot over the last several years about possibly being that lead analyst over at this other network that i don't work for nbc you know, you were up there, I believe, when Paul Azinger got the job. Y'all were in some talks, and now your name is brought up again. They're trying some different people out. How interested are you in doing TV, and what interests you about it? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'd still prefer to play golf. But if I couldn't play golf, it would just be a great way to stay involved. I mean, I sit around, like most of us sit around and think about golf all the time because golf is that's what we do. Um, it'd be great to be involved. Those big events, the tour is still a really fun place to be, to sort of be part of that still if I wasn't playing would be really nice. Um, and and see it from the other side. I think when we were all, when we were all young and Johnny was like bagging us on the air and <laughs> saying some stuff, like it was frustrating, right? But I think when you the older you get, you start realizing what he was actually doing and he was really good at it. Um, whether you agree with his opinion or not, opinions are interesting, you know. Um, so to just to do it from the other side, I thought Zinger was great too, you know. Um, I don't know. We'll, if, if it happens, it happens. I'm not chasing it. As I said, I'd rather hit really good shots and have full status and win golf tournaments and all that for the next few years. Um, but if I don't and I end up doing TV, I think, it, I think I could sort of get excited about it and try to do a good job at it. I think... Golf broadcast could be better. I was gonna, that was going to be one of my questions. What, um, what would you like to see different? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a TV guy. Like I just know that it hasn't really changed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bit of technology. I think Shot Trace has been really good for it um, on the technical front. But I think there's some really interesting minds talking on there, and no one really ever gets much space to talk. You know, I think this format's fantastic because you actually get to talk it out whereas when you get four we'll go down to you cold on 15 and you get four seconds and then we go somewhere else and then they get four seconds and you go somewhere else and they get six seconds i think you don't get the value of the great golf minds like on the broadcast because they're all just cut into five second bits you know i don't know how you fix that i'm not a tv person but um it'd be interesting to be able to play around with stuff like that yeah four seconds is only a long time in one situation <laughs> what's that <laughs> yeah but then if you you, you said it perfectly you got like, 15 boom four seconds explain the lie the pen boom done now we're back over here to 13 or whatever and no one gets to talk for very long but if you aren't showing shots one after the other after the other then the people are like yo show me some shot you know what i mean it's like i, I don't know how you balance there's so much it's not a football game we're like okay play ended we got 38 seconds till they snap the ball again boom go troy aikman whoever tell me what you saw it's like it's always just bam bam you never really get i'm in totally in agreement with you but you never get anyone to like lay out and be like talk to me what's going on right now you know give me more detail i guess and look there's some smart people who do the market research and they see all the ratings and they work out what the audience wants and they give them what the audience wants, you know? Um, but me personally, I would rather hear Colt talk about Xander Shoffley's play on the last four holes for five minutes, you know, rather see, than four seconds. That's always been like my argument. Like I'm new to this, but golf broadcasts haven't changed over time. It's like, okay, it's me. I'm with Xander on nine. Well, once we go to 10, we got to go to that. We can't do that. Like, let it be conversational. Like, if you and I are having a discussion about something Xander's working on and it goes over into the next shot, it's no big deal. It's not like we're not showing that next shot. And if something crazy happens on that shot, we'll talk about it. But if not, if it's just a shot that goes in there to 15, 20 feet, like, 
I feel like our conversation is way more interesting than saying, oh, and over at 10, Jordan Spieth's hitting 700 from 180. Yeah, because when I'm watching the football and I'm hearing Tony Romo talk about football, I want to listen to him talk about football, you know, not just call the play that happened because I saw that play. You know, I want yeah, you to I talk saw... about like your situations like that. What were you thinking? Like, how does that unfold? Does it really hurt when you get hit that hard? Like all that sort of stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, here I come like the safeties. Stuff. Watch this guy. Watch the weak side. Like he explains it because they had some time in between plays. You yeah. know what I mean? But golf's like, oh, it's... he had a seven hundred fifteen feet. Go over to twelve. Oh, he got so and so. He's here with the nine iron. Bam. I think that's what's so cool. Like you said about football, it's like okay, say Josh Allen throws an interception and everybody at home's like, how did he not see that guy? Well, Tony Romo can break it down and be like, this is why he didn't see him. Yeah. And I think that's what's fascinating. You learn every time you watch it. Yeah. That's what I want to learn. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think golf, I don't know. There's obviously smarter people than you and me working on all this <laughs> easy, sort of stuff. Easy. <laughs> um, and there's ads you got to fit in and all the promos and all that sort of stuff. But I, uh, I'd love to see the announcers have a bit more space, like a conversation between you and Frank and Finchie. That's and, always intelligent <laughs> between Frank and I. Um, you know, I'd be, I think it'd be fascinating, but maybe golf doesn't work that way. Well, whatever you decide, if you do decide to get in there, I think you're going to be one. Of, I think you're the best option available. I think you'd kill it, but I know you're head down on golf right now. And then, like like you mentioned, 46, then you said Champions Tour interests you too. So it's like, do you have, are you to a point where you got to kind of pick? Like, yeah, you know what? I'd love, I would love to be in the booth. And that's something I kind of like the window is now if I want to pursue that opportunity. Or it's like, no, I don't want to. I want to keep playing. And then when I turn 50, I want to start playing Champions Tour. Is it kind of one or the other? It feels like when you go in the booth, you don't come back a little bit. Um, not many do, if any, really come yeah, back. I think so, what, like Noda's kind of playing some, isn't he? A little Justin on champions, like on the guys champions. have done it, but I don't know what like what success or you know. Yeah, and Duval's trying to go back on that golf course. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It feels like you're sort of like flying the white flag to golf a little bit, um, and that would be my hesitation. It wouldn't be that I wouldn't like doing it. I feel like if I could, if you could do that for half the tournaments and play the other tournaments, that'd be great. I mean, you'd be traveling a lot, but um, as I said, I'm not going to bed every night like fingers crossed that i yeah get the job but like if it turns out that way it's obviously a great it's a great thing to do um and it would be really fun i could put my head down on it and not have to worry about how i was hitting it anymore um also not the worst yeah that's, that's <laughs> the best part. also not the worst <laughs> so yeah we'll see who knows you know, it, with your playing do you have any idea like where you might expect to play this year is it hard to put a schedule together you got any idea yeah i got no idea i mean the schedule's i mean i got a few quite a few last year out of the category i'm in um which is right down the bottom of the pecking order which is where i should be um don't know this year seems different because they've changed it and the fall doesn't really count anymore or well, does but it doesn't really everyone's going to be playing a little bit more i think in this part of the season you know january through august i think yeah. we'll be a bit more stacked every week that being said, there's a few guys have gone. Um, there's an extra there's an extra opposite event this year in Myrtle Beach. I don't know. I'll get a few. I'll get a few, and hopefully I can pinch an invite or two. And really, if you're playing well, six or seven tournaments is enough to get going again. If you're playing poorly, fifty events isn't enough. You know what I mean? Like it's all about how you play. I'm going to get a few opportunities, and if I play half decently, then maybe a tournament director's like, "Oh, just playing all right again. Maybe I'll give him a run in my tournament." And then off you off to the races, right? You have a top ten, you get in the next one um but if it doesn't work out i just i guess i'll just as i said i've got that little guiding light i want to just keep playing well and keep grinding on it and get better and if i when i get a, when i get a chance i'll do it if i don't then i'll just keep going to whisperock and taking charlie v's money no oh, he's got a lot of it he'll be fine you should just go in the booth once like camilo and then go out and win again yeah it's right gonna work for him yeah you know i mean camilo is similar sort of situation he was sort of on again off again not sort of he never stopped grinding but um found a rich vein of form and yeah, play, you know he's back. Awesome. You know, yeah, it's really awesome. cool to Fantastic. see. Fantastic. Yeah. Let me let me ask you one thing about your playing career because you've seen a lot of guys come and go, but you know during your prime, Tiger was the only guy that was really talked about. Tiger and Phil, who was a guy that you felt was like severely underrated? That every time you play with him, you're like, "Fuck, he's good," and he doesn't get near the credit he deserves. Um, the first one I ever played with that I was better than I ever imagined he could be was Colin Montgomery. Mm. He was that was sort of late nineties in Europe. He was. I still had never seen anybody from inside 200 yards. He's as good as anyone I've ever seen. Maybe not from 30 feet, but from, from hundred to 200 yards, he hit it next to the hole in every shot. He was unbelievable. He won seven order merits in a row in mm -hmm. Europe, which is just mm -hmm. dominance of a Tiger Woods sort of level, right? Um, Ernie Earls, clearly everybody's going to roll their eyes and say he was rated, but he was 
better than people think. He was so good. It was in, it was just ridiculous. No Tiger, he was the guy, you know, easily. He was easily the second best golfer there through that stretch. I heard Tiger was like, he was the only guy he, Ernie was the only guy he thought could give him a run. If Ernie was playing his best, Tiger had to really, yeah. he had to play really well. You know, Tiger seemed to be able to beat guys sort of not being fully on, but he wouldn't have beaten Ernie if Ernie was on. That battle they had at Maui where they went to the playoff, that, yeah. Was, yeah. that was cool. They had some good ones. I mean, President's Cup, that, I mean, no, they weren't head down, but that playoff. That President's Cup playoff in the dark. I mean, it's the best Holland President's like, Cup moment of all time. Yeah. And the, the pressure, like, looking back on in the dark, like, by the way, this is for everything. You know, one guy on each side, and you knew who it was going to be. Nicholas and Gary play your captains the whole on the side of the green. Yeah. yeah. Nah, that was crazy. Ernie was really, really special. Um, the first time I played with DJ, I couldn't believe anyone could be that good. <laughs> yeah. You know? He's, dude. DJ, I mean, unbelievable career. I was a two-time major champion, like, but that's the guy I, I grew up with. And, like, he, we all knew, like, coming out of college, everybody's like, oh, we had this great Walker Cup team. Everybody's so, who's going to be the best? And it was unanimous. Like, Dustin's going to be the best. He's so good. Like, the first time I played with him was at Akron. It might have been his first year. Because did he win his first year or he won his he second won year? He won late. He was, like, in threat of, like, losing his card. He won, I think it was Turning Stone, he won I think. Stone. Okay, yeah. so it must have been the year after that, he, his like, second year on tour. his card, and then it was bam, every year. And... You know what, like, what's like, well, when you're doing well on tour, you don't really look down the money list. You just sort of, you think you're one of the big guys and you just don't pay any attention. But I had never really heard of DJ. He'd been on the tour, I guess, nearly two years. I played with him in Akron. And after about six holes, I turned to score. I'm like, who is this guy? This guy's a joke. <laughs> um, it's just, <laughs> no, it was nuts. Like, I'd never been more impressed. He was pretty special and such a good guy to play with. Always in a good mood. Never grumpy he never got mad 76 76 he didn't care he'd just go to the next tournament and then he'd just go win like yeah bulletproof confidence i mean i don't know and a smarter golfer than like people would give him credit for i mean he's not opening an algebra book and like beating anybody but on the golf course he played really smart he missed it in the right spot he had a golf wisdom that was really underestimated or has i don't know we haven't seen him play for a couple of years but um yeah amazing yeah he gets talked pass. about like Right. You know, yeah, just walked up, hit it. Not the smartest guy. Like, that's kind of like the rap on him. But, like, look at the Chambers Bay US Open where he three puts the last hole. Like, that would cripple most guys for like their career. And I think it's a skill to be able to just like put it away and be done and move on and still go on to like not have that affect you after the fact. You know? Yeah. And I think anyone who'd played that tournament, um, anyone who'd played that tournament would have looked back and gone, well, that could have not happened. That could have happened to anybody. I mean, the way those greens were, like, the only people who were like getting on him for three putting that were people who weren't inside the ropes mm. that week. Like anyone yeah, who played Jordan that week was holding like, it from everywhere. Yeah, that was that was nuts. I'll tell you one DJ story. So a couple of years ago, um, PJ Championship Harding Park, his brother's caddying for him, who is just as big a beauty. AJ, I'm out walking a practice round with him, and it's it's you've been there. It's you played the Presidents Cup there. It's cold. It's foggy. Ball didn't go anywhere. I was like, DJ, how much shorter do your irons go here? He's like. I don't know, bro. Like club, club and a half. AJ goes, I better write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting on like 10, 15 yards. No, I don't know. I don't know. Like club, club and a half, maybe. So but, simple the way you guys yeah. about it. Like it show it pro it shows that you don't need to go into all the detail that no. we go at all. You know, you just aim it and hit it, really. And when he got the driver go like when he gets the Ugh. driver going, is there anyone you've ever played with like when DJ's going with it? Like he could win a tournament almost exclusively with that club. Not that it's given, but like he's just gonna be in spots that nobody else is, and from there you're just going to accidentally make birdies. The only other one in this era is probably Rory. Yeah, I mean, like Rory's two. just... The first time I played with him uh, was in the match play in Tucson. And it was like quarterfinals or something. And he's still... He was still... This is before the gym, so he's short and he's like yeah. a little bit chubby. And everyone's like, this guy's amazing. He must have been pretty good because he was just turned pro when he was in the match play. Mm -hmm. And I was playing really, really well. And I was like six or seven under after about 15 holes, two up. And I birdied... 15 16 and 17 to win two and one like I, he birdied 15 16 17 on top of me and we get in the van they get they pick you up in a little van to take you back to the clubhouse like in that tournament because you finish out on the golf course and we just sit down squirrel him and you know squirrel I didn't say anything really and then he just turns to me and goes well that guy's the next number one player in the world and that was it good call. it was so obvious it was just this guy's just we're all playing for second with this guy and he's still doing it i mean his career has been I mean, they're going to pick on him for not winning a major for a decade, but that guy's in contention every week he plays. His game is yeah. – so you mentioned Squirrel, your longtime caddy. Um, we shared a ride back in New Orleans, one of your, me, him, and a couple other caddies. 
And I'm not going to say the player's name, but the player shot like 88 in New Orleans, which is really hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I, I'm scrolling through the leaderboard. I go, holy shit, so-and-so shot 88. And Squirrel just out of the back goes, was his book in Metis? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that is just beautiful. He is a character. Funny man. Yeah, really wise. I was very, very lucky to have him through the chunk of my... I mean, he definitely... I was definitely a better player because he was on my back. Absolutely. Yeah, that was during your run... In the while we were on the match play topic, what's the secret? You're, I mean, who's better at it than you during that run? What is it? Give it to us. You just got to refuse to lose, I think. Um, it's all in the head. It's got nothing to do with golf, I don't think. Well, it's obviously got a bit to do with golf. But once you get to a certain point, I think it's, I don't know, it's, I don't know what it is. I mean, I see, I've, I've been watching J2, JT and Siwoo at, um, the President's Cup, they were two hard-headed, stubborn people like me, and they were both refusing to lose. I mean, that was when you get two guys in the right headspace. Um, I don't know. It's a headspace. Like, you just got to think yeah, you're going to you got to think you, you just got to know you're going to win. You know, it's the craziest thing because there's some dudes that are unbelievable talents, win tons of golf tournaments. You look at their match play record and Ryder Cup, President's Cup, whatever. Not great. And then you look at guys like, oh, yeah, he's solid, but nothing close to this other guy. And you look at their record and like he beats everybody. It's, I mean, it's, there's something just different about it. Gets your juices going more than I don't know. Play. To me, it was fun. And I, I mean, I liked all the little head games in it, too. Um, you know, just. I don't know. You've always got to get your opponent to see your ball. I mean, you give them a three footer on the first. You don't give them a two footer on the second. They start getting annoyed. I mean, the best thing is when they get annoyed when you don't give them gimmies. It's like the, my favorite game to play. Like, I don't know. All that stuff I think is when you don't have to worry about score and it's just you and another guy. I think it gets to me. That's the most fun, you know. But for other guys trying to piece together a four day tournament and have two hundred and seventy shots and have one shot less than the next guy, that's and that's just as valid. Um, but to me, oh, yeah, my juices got flowing in the match play. I loved it. I was you were just going to ask if you had any yeah. like little secret things you like to do to piss people off. That was it, the putting? Like, give them one that's longer, then make them put one that's shorter? Yeah, and for some reason, I mean, I've been a bit of a... Uh, I've had a roller coaster of emotions on the golf course, generally. Um, I've been up and down. Um, match play, for whatever reason, I just refused to give the guy any hope. You know, I just stayed flat line. Like, I was... I actually talked to Doc Rotella about it after, after about two minutes at Riviera or like the or another week after. It would have been in Doral or somewhere way back after the second time I won it. And he's like, that's fun and you look like you have a good time. And we just talked about it. I said, yeah, I just, I love staying level and like making the other guy think he hasn't got a chance. Like, didn't matter how bad a shot I had, I would never get annoyed, you know, because I knew that would give him a little bit of a boost. For whatever reason, match play got me where I should have been all the time. <laughs> Yeah, you know? it's different for whatever reason. Yeah, like, I don't know. No score. Go out and try to play match play when it wasn't match play and I couldn't do it and I'd be like winging my dandine back in my bag on the <laughs> third hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just easier to get over a bad shot. Like you quick hook one, like, oh, that'd be double, maybe worse or something in a stroke. Like, oh my God, I got to make three birdies now just to get back, level up. Bad swing and match play. Oh, I lost the hole. One. Yeah, you don't carry like, it with you. You just, just go over. the next like, hole. Yeah, yeah, it's easier to have a short It's memory. easier to go one shot at like truly yeah. one shot at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're a beast at it. There's no doubt. Um, yeah, Got to ask you, everything that's going on in the world of golf right now, Live, PGA Tour, PIF, private investment, all that nonsense. What's your uh, what's your thought on everything? Is this good for the game of golf? Are we heading in the right direction? Or do you think this is tearing the game apart? Uh, I think it's tearing the game apart at the moment. I don't think it's necessarily like the worst thing to have competition. You know, I think from a player point of view, I think the PGA Tour, or instantly their reaction was that the, the, the players are now better off because this came along. The top players, at least. Financially. You know, fin financially. Um, so I don't think competition's bad. I think it hasn't been handled amazingly. Um, I think it'll be ro Rocky Road until they decide to agree on something, whatever that is. You know, I think there's enough. Fifty-two weeks in the year is a long time. Is a long. Is a lot of weeks. I think there's room for more than just one product on the calendar. Um, that being said, I think the PGA Tour. I'm a PGA Tour fanboy. I think their product has always been the best. They've got a lot of tradition. It's been going for a really long time. Um, but a bit of room on the calendar for someone to do something interesting. I mean, seventy-two hole stroke play forty-five times in a row kind of gets a bit boring. You know, I mean, throwing something different out there. I think is interesting. I don't I, I don't like that the there's some great players on this side and there's some great players on the other yeah. side and 
I don't like that. I think four times a year isn't enough to see the best players in the world get together. Um, and we, we probably almost don't at this point, but I think the majors will work out how to get everyone in their fields because they're independent and they want the best fields. Of course, yeah. I think that's, I mean, golf's just not big enough to be divided, right? You can't have, we don't have NFL fans, NFL money. Like you can't have some of the best players here and some of them over here and they're competing against each other. Like you want them all together, whether it be 10, 15, 20 times a year. I think we just got to figure out a way for them to all be back together. I mean, the, the money has just gotten so out of control, which yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can't blame a player for taking a hundred million dollars. Like that's just, it's just insane money, but it's just, I feel like that's all that's talked about now is the money. Like, yeah, no one cares that so-and-so won Riviera or Bay Hill or anything. It's like, cool. so and so's going to live. He's getting $150 million. Yeah, and I think money is a bad measure. Um, and the money's great for the top guys, as I said, but I, it isn't going well for probably the 100th ranked guy in the US now, as well as it was a few years ago, you know, because it's all seemed, the money's all going to the top. Um, we'll see. I mean, I don't know. Like, I think competition is good. A bit of a stir up, maybe the tour probably maybe needed it. Um, I'd like to see it get a bit global. I mean, I like that Liv goes all over the place, you know. I wish the PGA Tour had decided to sort of maybe use the fall like for real and go overseas um, all those times. But um, because, I mean, that's sort of the the booster rocket that Tiger Woods was for the PGA Tour made golf more of a global game. You know, people were more interested in what PGA Tour players watching them play. So all the advantages that the Tour got out of Tiger Woods have kind of come and said, well, you kind of have to take this global a little bit because that's well, there's value over there, you know. So I don't know. Who knows? I just nothing. Th there's room on the calendar for everyone, um, and I would just like to see at some point. I don't know how you get there from here, but where everyone at least, like you said, ten, twelve times a year gets to play against each other again. Okay, let me put you on the spot here. You're you're the number three player in the world again. Greg Norman calls says, Jeff, we want you to come to live. We're going to offer you hundred million dollars. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I never had that decision to make. Thank God. Um, well, I don't know. It sounds like a pretty good decision, but <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, if I was twenty-four, I think I'd be really hard. I think if I was thirty-eight or something, like DJ was, I think it'd be a bit easier decision. Um, I don't know. I feel for those kids. I feel for these kids who are coming out of school and getting snapped up straight out of school, which is great for them. They're going to make money straight away. But there's a lot of learning and golf experience and the journey that you're going to miss. I mean, there's something about traveling to a town with a bunch of people grinding away at a game that you're really never going to work out. No one else is going to work out staying in a crappy hotel, having dinner together, doing it for four rounds, repeat and just doing that. There's some really nice sort of cadence and sort of path to that journey. And these kids are just going straight onto private jets and straight out of school. And they're not, they're probably missing out on a bit of golf learning, you know? Yeah. Um, and that fun that we had, like on the grind early days. Um, and if they never have a way back, that's tough for them. I don't know. I just hope everyone at some point, it's going to take a while. It's obviously really complicated. And there's, this has got political ramifications. I mean, it's a big situation, but hopefully it gets worked out where it can kind of come back to, it'll never be normal again, um, but it come back to a place where kids grow up aspiring to be golfers and playing with the best golfers in the world and they can yeah have you talked to because the australia events were a huge success we just had carlos ortiz on he talked about like that how spectacular that one was have you talked to cam smith or or leash or anybody about like what their experience has been like with it so far the guys i've talked to they're having a great time yeah like it's a bit looser they don't have that sort of cut stress and that sort of grinding away at their game stress that 70 percent of the tour is like usually under some sort of stress at least 70 is probably underrating it whereas i think they have a little bit less of that it's just a bit more enjoyable a bit more relaxed um they're playing in shorts they're only out there for five hours and then they go home um three rounds making a lot of money um the events have got music and stuff going i mean i think there's a lot of things going i mean as i said there's room in the calendar for that stuff i mean it doesn't need to be a sort of button down 72 hole sort of grind fest 50 times in a row you know yeah. um the guys out there they they're having a great time adelaide was an amazing success i mean everyone i talked to in australia everybody i know 
Because, I mean, I know a lot of people in the golf world, they all went and they all said it was fantastic. Well, Australia yeah. just They're loves star golf. for golf, too. Yeah. I mean, the President's have... Cup, huge success. I mean, I'm with you. Like, you know, in the fall the fall schedule into November when it's nice down there in Australia, like, why not? I mean, it'd be it'd be great. I don't. No matter what tour goes there, it's going to be a success. Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, and this, and Australia's not the only place. I mean, oh, of course. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the Zozo is a success in mm-hmm. Japan. I mean, they love saying... Top 50 guys in the world come to their tournament. So, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Nobody happens. nobody knows where it's going to end up. Um, hopefully, it ends up somewhere good sooner yes, rather than later. Please. You yeah. know? We'll so see. Then we can stop talking we'll about see. it too yeah. and get back to talking about great golf. Um, let's get to the E9 here. We could talk with you for 10 hours. So fast. You're so fascinating, Jeff Ogilvy. Um, I think we should go with, for our first question, celebrity crush for Jeff Ogilvy. Celebrity crush. Yeah, you can do current or when you're coming up. Yeah. As a youth. I don't know. Yeah, I don't want you to make anybody jealous right now or anything. Maybe yeah, we, yeah. No. we got to. I had a lightly. Samantha Fox poster on my wall when I was really young. You remember saying you probably too young. Samantha. No, give me. What well, was Shan. Shan Fox? Let me Google it real quick. Um, Hell McPherson was up there for us Aussie boys. Um, <laughs> currently, I don't know. Gal Gadot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was all there sense. in the 80s. Mm. Yeah. Makes sense. Alyssa Milano and Who's the Boss? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, like there's a current Aussie that's getting a lot of votes. Right Margot now. Robbie yeah, would be getting a few votes. Uh, yeah. To anyone that's eligible for the question, I think she's batting about <laughs> 750 mm-hmm. on that Yeah, answer. no, she's strong. Yeah, yeah, she's doing good. Um, all right, next one. I'll ask you this one. How much credit does Jim Strickland deserve for lighting the fire that led to your success on the PGA Tour at a certain zero club championship maybe an out out dueling of the (laughs) sorts head-to-head type of uh, we did we ended up coming down the straight this was before it was match play it was stroke play and like we were i don't know four or five in front of third or something and i uh i shelled it to the trees on the last i think i think i was a couple in front of him on the back nine and i just let it go yeah um he beat you yeah he did well i beat myself really (laughs) Um, he was the benefactor but he was a pretty good player back then yeah he you can know, play. he's still a good Phil player. Phil can play. Yeah. He's still a good player. Played with Phil at ASU. I mean, it ain't no shame. But, but this is 20 years ago, so he was probably only in his 30s. Yeah. Um, still hitting it far. Yeah, that was a disappointing day. One of the only places you can lose your club championship and then go win on the PJ yeah. Tour. Yeah. Like, well, that was quick thereafter, wasn't it? And that's still I true. mean, he still takes crazy. He's like, dude, yeah, it was the, it was the 36 whole day with Jeff. Like, yeah, no. Nah, nah, play, we played. You we had a good the, day. I remember that day. You won the twin fin with him. I won the twin fin with him. He's won some shit, dude. Yeah, yeah he might be the he's secret, a gamer actually. too. When it comes down to yeah. it, like he doesn't miss it. He's, he's a good, he's a gamer. Now, yeah, he wants to kill people. Yeah, yeah, he's beautiful. Um, all right, we mentioned Tiger earlier and all the times you played with him. Best shot, first one that comes to mind. Best shot you saw him hit in person. Um, we we're in Thailand. Thailand. I was playing with him and Rod Pampling. It was a Saturday, I think, and it was a par five, and it was kind of like an island green. I can't remember what hole, like five or six on the front nine. And I hit it. We all hit the tee shot. I'm the shortest tee shot. I've got, I don't know, 250 over the water and then 25. Pamps is about five in front of me and Tiger's about five in front of him. I didn't think I could get there, so I laid it up. Pamps was really long at that time, hits three wood, hits it reasonably short in the water. Tiger hit four on to 10 feet, like over the moon. It was like, I've never seen anything like it. It was like... Hmm. This is 10 yards in front of me, and this was beyond. Mike couldn't get my three wood over the water. Yeah, and he's front flown line. four iron further than I was going to fly my three wood and hit it to about 10 feet. I was like, yeah, nah, this guy's different. That was the first really amazing shot I saw him hit. It's one thing about asking that question is like everyone that's played with him has some shot that like nobody, it's not like the chip in at 16 at Augusta. You know what I mean? It's some random Thursday afternoon. And he was hitting and that ball flight. Shot. The ball flight that everybody does now is like kind of goes up and doesn't spin. It just hangs out. He was doing that with Titleist Professional. Like he was doing that with the pre Pro V one stuff. Like it was nuts. He was nuts. And that PT fifteen three wood he had, my God. Yeah. The technology just, probably hurt. He was hitting more. shots like we hit now with the three wood then with that yeah. stuff. That's the hardest Different. club to hit in the history of golf. The Titleist PT. Off a, ton, a tee, a you could hit it as far as your driver, maybe further off the ground. You could, li- I mean, you could top it fifty percent of the time. Yeah, no, hardest he was, club to hit. Ever. He was so good, and he used a blade two on like uh, the Mizuno's or the MP twenty nines. Yeah. Um, and he hit that two on so long and so high. Unbelievable. Oh, he's a different animal. Um, all right, I'll give you a chance here because I know you're a surfer, right? You like to get in the water. You like to 
shred the gnar. You and Adam Scott are sharing the same wave. Who shreds harder? Uh, when I was spending a lot more time in San Diego, I probably was doing a little bit better than him, but he's probably been a bit more consistent. So I'll go for him just. A current but day. we're both about 18 handicappers, let's be fair. But okay. um, we're about the same. He's out there at Kelly Slater's Wave Ranch or whatever. Yeah, he's practicing on. Like, he's got. He's hanging out with Kelly and likes to take his shirt off. So. Right, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, everyone likes it when he takes his shirt off. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one. I don't know if you noticed this, but Sleaze is rocking a little Puma gear over there. I like it. He yeah. Used to be a Cobra Puma guy. Mm -hmm. He is newly signed to the brand. Nice. Well, do you think yeah. Sleaze is getting closer to Ricky Fowler money or Jeff Ogilvy money? Definitely not either. Ricky Fowler money. <laughs> yeah. I'll take, I'll take either. either. I just said, yeah, just give me what Ricky got. I, I think Ricky I'll money was it. better than my money. Um, Ricky Fowler money. <laughs> Everyone's special. moving the needle. You know yeah. what I mean? Everyone it's moves a little group bit. Group effort. It's a good brand for you. Group effort. Lots of colors. Oh, the new stuff. I love it. Hit Bright colors. Right now. You can see it Those shoes I saw at the golf show, they're pretty crazy. Yeah, you like that? Those yeah. little court ones? You tried yeah. them? No, but I'm about to on the way. I'll keep you on the ground. I feel fast in those pitches. I can't wait till Sleaze in a commercial with Ricky. It's going to yes. be good. It's going to be big. Like old Tiger juggling the ball. Nike stuff. Is that, in the, the is that in the plans, in the pipeline? Eh, in my plans. I don't know if it's in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? We'll figure it out. Uh, all right, I got two more. I'll give you a philosoph. This is a philosophical question. You're a philosophical man. Explain to me. My theory is, of all the people I've met across the world, as a, on a percentage basis, Australians are the coolest. If you meet 100 Aussies, 90 plus percent of them are awesome. Do you agree with that? And if so, why? More than any other nationality. I don't know. I mean, they're just Australians to me, but I understand why people think that. They're all cool. They're all chill, funny. They like to have a good time. It's like nowhere else you go as a percentage. I feel like yeah. that like that. I'd say it's pretty fair. Um, someone explained, someone said it ages ago, and I can't remember who said it. It, was just, it doesn't really matter who said it, but they said Americans live to work. Australians mm. work to live. Australians go to the Australians get a job so they can go to the pub and have a few beers. You know, Americans wake up so they can make, lots, make lots of money. Week, Australians, Australians aren't obsessed with making lots of money; they just want to have a good time. Generally speaking, um, yeah, I think we're pretty laid back. We're pretty straight. We don't have any history. We don't. You guys have. Well, America sort of took over a country and there's been civil wars and wars and you've been sort of leading the, the way and Europe's the same. There's just, just lots of complicated history. Australia has no history. We just sit, Hang out. sit down there miles away from everybody and just sit on sit in the sunshine. Hang out. Drink have a, beer, have yeah. a pint. Smash Fosters. Yeah. It's, there seems surf. to be less stress the further away from all the action you are. Yeah. It's about... A Leishman Lager. I will end up Lager. Leishman yeah. Lager. Good beer. I like it. All right. You mentioned your caddy squirrel. Great nickname. First off, I need to know why it's Squirrel. And second, what's your favorite caddy nickname you've come across? Um, he was never really very uh, forthcoming about the Squirrel thing. There was a story. He was playing with a golfer. He was caddying for a golfer, Lindsay Stephen, who was an Australian guy who played in Europe for a long time. And he used to call everybody something. You know those people, those, those older boys who just, they never call you by your name. They're like... Mm -hmm. Um, and he was, he'd hit it in this long stuff. And in Germany, quite often there's like restrictions on how much of the grass or something they can cut. And so you're about 20 yards off the fairway and it's just hay, like it's six foot deep hay. And I guess Lindsay had hit it in this stuff and he's like, where's my man? Where is he? And squirrel goes like this, pushes the grass down and goes like this. He said, oh, squirrel, you're in there. And that was it. And That's it stuck. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But he said that wasn't why it happened, but, um, I ran with that story. Um, best nicknames? I don't know. There's a lot of them. I mean, Europe especially. Uh, there was a guy, the man in the pub. That was his nickname? His nickname was the man because he looked like every time you go to the pub, there's a guy who looks like that. Like he just... <laughs> 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 um, Is that what they call it though? They walk up and hey, man in the pub. Man in the What's pub. What's up? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. That's what it's good. Lots of body parts. The head, the lip. Yeah, a lot of body yeah. parts. The man in the pub. That was the most creative. That's funny. It's good. Caddies have great nicknames. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the best stories. Um, all right, my last one here. Are you the only U.S. Open champ to celebrate in the lobby of a Marriott Residence Inn? I don't know, but it Probably. was fun. It was a Crown Plaza, actually. Crown Plaza. Yeah. Okay. And we'd been there for two weeks. It was funny because uh, we played Westchester the week before. 
back when we used to play at Westchester, we had, so I was in the same Crown Plaza room, whatever, I can't even remember the room number, 724 or something in for 15 days. And it was the atrium lobby too. So everyone who walked in the front of the door, like walked through this bar situation. And it was a fun night because lots of people, lots of randoms who'd been to the tournament and just randos got to come through and have a beer and drink it. I mean, 50 people drank out of it that night. It was fun. And Adam Scott was on his plane, right? I think we asked him about it when he came on. Like he was on his plane, saw that you'd won. And was like, I can't leave. Came back. And I mean, I mean, imagine being a fan and walking into your hotel. Like, all right, we're done for the week. What a great week. And then there you and Adam Scott are like celebrating. No, nah, no, nah, it was fun. Yeah, he was on Ernie's plane flying back to London, um, sitting down in the seat, I guess. And he's like, no, nah, I can't do this. I've got to stay. And he got off. What a came. guy. Yeah, what a guy. Yeah. That's Might have awesome. saved him some physical, you know. Well, he probably had to go get, go get on an American Airlines learning. the next day or something. So. Yeah. Yeah, might have saved him some you know I mean? money on the airplane. Yeah, yeah. yeah saved him some medical <laughs> bills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he might have drank less celebrating with you than with Arnie. Oh, I think for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Definitely took less headbutts. All right, last one. <laughs> What's the most number of golf clubs you've ever been hit with at one time? Golf clubs? Yeah. Hit with? Mm. There's a story behind this, no? Hilton Head. Did I get hit by golf clubs? <laughs> Rumor had it the squirrel threw the entire bag at you. Oh, you may have. <laughs> <laughs> he may have. You this don't remember this? Occurrence. No, I don't remember this. Where'd you get this story from? He souped it on 14, I heard, slammed the club in the bag, and it hit his finger, and he picked the whole bag up and threw it at you. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hit him. I mean, it happens. If someone caddies for you for a long time, I mean, you accidentally hit your caddy's hand every now and then when you put the club back in the back. and i felt instantly guilty straight away and he i was probably had my head up my ass for the last six holes or six months probably for who knows um and that probably flipped him yeah he snapped back a couple of times as he should have <laughs> because that snaps me out of it right yeah. um the whole bag i don't remember the whole bag mm, could have been got bad it's aggressive. Info, it's... no it's probably good it's probably the right info it could, it could definitely have happened <laughs> as a caddy you just don't put your fingers over you the get bag your hand away from the bag yeah you go ahead and slam it and then i'll grab it yeah that's a guy that's confident in his job security too yeah throw absolutely. a little bag at the boss you know what i mean oh this will be fine i mean that's why he was such a great caddy he wasn't trying to ever keep his job he was trying to do the best job he could how long did he caddy for you for uh 13 years wow what's yeah. he doing now he caddies he's got a few favorites he caddies for kelson and tom lewis and um fills in a bit i think he did a couple of weeks for luke Luke, a couple of years ago, like he's a beauty. Yeah, he is. He's he's the best. All right, well, so are you, my man. That was a lot of fun. Thank you so Jeff, much. Thank Jeff. you. One of the most fascinating talks in golf. Appreciate you, my man. Good stuff. All right, that was Jeff Ogilvy on Subpar. Sleeth. He's one of my favorite guys in the world of golf. Always loved playing with him at Whisper Rock or out on tour. He is just he is so thoughtful. Has some great opinions, some great insight in the game of golf. It was really fun sitting down with him. Dude, back in the day before he moved and took his little hiatus, he was at the Rock a lot of times when I was when I was still playing out there. And similarly, like he wasn't a big ball hitter. He liked to hit a few balls, but he mostly liked to play golf. I was the exact same way. So Jeff and I would hop in a cart. We played tons of holes together. And to this day, when people say like, "Who's the most fun guy to play with?" Jeff Ogilvy, you could ride around play eighteen holes. We'd play in like three hours or less. You could spend the entire time talking about golf. And you'd come away and you'd know a lot more. I'd ask him about his pitching all the time. I, th I think to this day is one of the most beautiful pitchers of the golf ball uh, that I've ever seen. And on the other side of that, you could play three hours and talk about golf zero. And he still has a ton to say. And there's not a ton of golfers like that. They're so tunnel visioned on golf. It's like talk about golf the entire time. But Jeff can do, you know, a variety of things. That's why I think if he chooses to, to do so, he'd be an unbelievable addition in the booth. Uh, for NBC. I know he's still got ambitions of playing. Uh, he's fully engaged and back in it, but he would be awesome, awesome in the booth. And he's still got his, like, he's got a lot of shit going on with the design company as well. What I took from that was you compared your game to Jeff Ogilvy's. Comparing my golf game to yeah. it? Yeah. Self suck, $20. I don't know. We didn't about get a little my, pot, my golf little bowl game right, here. right there. Just that I like to play with him and then he likes to talk about things other than golf. Let's get a little piggy bank. And do a little self suck piggy. I'd be bank happy right to. We'd, we'd, we'd load that thing up, dude. I'll be buying it. I'll be buying a Genesis GV80 at the end of this thing. Uh, but nobody got to see Tiger up close and personal as much as Jeff Ogilvy. I mean, this guy when he was in his prime, he was there. He was got to number three in the world. Battled it out with Tiger. Not really battled it out. Got to see Tiger dominate fields. But Jeff, like I said, one of my favorites. It was a lot of fun sitting down with him we'll i'm sure we'll have him on again in the future and wish wish him best luck in golf and as well as the design business 
or an analyst, whatever he wants to do. He's got, he's got options. options. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's good to be Jeff Ogilvy right now, and he's good at everything that he does right now. Some of those redesigns. Uh, look forward to seeing what Medina looks like. Shady Oaks turned out phenomenal. Um, they do a hell of a job, man. All right, well, let's get to some gambling. We're on to the Mexican Open down at Vedanta. I've been there. That place is awesome, by the way. Hotel, very nice incredible. rooms. Very nice rooms. Um, lighted par three course. Sick. They just finished an amusement park. They got a million restaurants. This is a great one. I covered it the last couple of years. Sad to miss it. Good one for the year. wives. Very good for the wives. Yeah. The field, eh? Let's be honest. Not the best. Um, Tony Finau, defending champion and massive favorite. So this is going to be a fun one to try to pick a winner for. I'm going a little down the board for my favorite. Okay. And you want me to tell you why? I would love to hear why. Because I saw him at Bel Air Country Club last week. That's the reason I'm picking him. And That's enough. I think he's a super nice guy. He hits it a mile. I don't think the U.S. knows enough about him. Former rugby player. His dad was one of uh, a legend over in New Zealand for the All Blacks. Like I said, I saw him. He was on the group ahead of me at Bel Air Country Club on Thursday because he wasn't in the field at Genesis. Going Ryan Fox at 35 to 1. Oh, nice. Out of nowhere. I like that. Did you see a guy outside? It's like saw seeing your teacher good. outside of school and realize they're a regular person. Boom. Ms. That's Davis? enough for me. Miss yeah. Davis? Miss <laughs> <Ms>. Davis. <laughs> Davis. Can't get her out of my mind. You know what I mean? Shout out, Miss Davis. God, what a good show. Um, all right. I'm going to go with a guy as my favorite who I picked as a dark horse just a few weeks ago. But like I said, field, solid. Not the best field in the world. This golf course, especially, if you can, it's a bomber's paradise. Hit it as hard as you can. That's why Tony Fino clearly loves the place. Uh, a lot of these guys that move it, great golf course for them. I mean, Thomas Dietrich, 25 to 1. Uh, coming off a 20th, a 4th, and a 28th. He's been playing good golf in this field, like we said, ain't the strongest in the world. I think he could make a big move this week. Love Thomas Dietrich. Also, future guest here at Subpar. We have got it on the books. Going to be filming with him soon. That's why I picked him. Yeah. Great yeah. hair. Hits it a mile. Love him. Swing's Very jealous. Beautiful. Yeah. He, he's coming. And by the way, I will say, I like Tony Fino a lot this week as far as gambling wise, though. I don't. He has a second and a first here. Loves the place. Uh, the little thing that worries me for those of you out there, they're going to load up on Tony Fino. It's a great family week. He's got all his kids down there. They do the lighted par three. The amusement park is now open. So I'm a little worried Tony might be a little banged up from the roller coasters and stuff. Busy week. Busy week for Tony down there. Going to be an expensive week, too. He can he's, got, he's got a lot of tickets. A lot of tickets to buy. But just think, he doesn't drink, so he doesn't spend money Check. on booze. So he gets to do it on fun. Yeah. Amusement parks. Yeah. And probably play great. All right. My dark horse going off at 60 to 1. Seen a little bit of resurgence in his game. Starting to play a little better. Hits at a mile, which... I think bodes it pretty matters. well around this golf it course. Matters. There's like two holes. You really got to focus on your tee shot. It's number 10 and number one. I mean, they get a little narrow. Other than that, you can absolutely send it. This guy sends it. He also speaks the language down there. Give me Johnny Vegas at 60 to one. I like that. And also just a streaky dude that comes out of nowhere. And when he does, he puts up birdies and bunches. Don't dislike that uh, at all. For my long shot, 70 to one. Mm. Friend of the program, recent resurgence in the game, two weeks removed from a near win. Uh, he's hitting it as hard as I can remember seeing him hit it, including some of those drives he hit on the 18th hole at TPC Scottsdale. Putter was looking good as well. 50th at Riv, I don't know, but he's still running hot, I, I believe, from Phoenix. And at 70-1 to 1 with this field, I think he could make a move. Give me the Seagull. Oh, Charlie wow. Hoffman, come on down, kid. Okay. Gonna... What do you think about that, huh? Man, I mean, it looked like he was going to get it done there at Phoenix. I would never say to his face I was rooting for him. Love Nick Taylor, who also has been on the show, but the Seagull, obviously, I have a great relationship with. Um, that was a tough one. He played so great, 64-64 on the weekend at Phoenix. Probably was a little tired last week at the Genesis, but grinded out a cut and a $52,000 payday or whatever. A nice little last. bonus for a week that he was planning on going skiing instead. So Slightly better. Around so, yes, nicely. Seagull. Keep, he's sent, dude, keep he's moving it too. We had him on radio. He's talking about it. He's like, yeah, it's more just about like staying healthy and things like that. But dude, some of those drives he had on 18, the one who carried the water in regulation. I'm like, dude, that was down there in JB Holmes territory. Like he, I know he's 48, but like he's still moving it. Yeah, he absolutely does move it. And um, on a sad note, football's over, man. Dude, <laughs> the, the, golf ended, watch? the golf ended yesterday and immediately my brain just out of default was like, oh, what's the night game? What's the night? And I was like, Oh, no mm -hmm. night game. So you know what I turned on? The NBA All-Star game, which 
sucked. I, I don't know why they have it. I mean, Luca's jacking up three quarter court shots just for fun. Two for one. It's the score's two hundred and seven to one hundred and ninety. Was it five? Like three hundred ninety seven points combined. It's a joke. I I'm just like, like it's cool, I guess, to see some dunks and stuff like that. But like, why are we really having this? All the dudes just trot around shoot threes, dunk, and try not to get hurt. The best was the three-point contest, and then also Steph Curry versus Sabrina Ionescu, which was awesome. Sabrina held her own shooting from the NBA three-point line, too. Got beat 29-26 to 26 against probably the greatest the shooter greatest of all time. The greatest shooter of all time, yeah, and would have made the, like, the finals uh, otherwise. It was um, the dunk contest needs revamping. When you got a dude that plays in the G League that pretty much has this thing locked up, I think you need to change that. But the whole All-Star, like, the going from like, meaningful football after golf for weeks and weeks and weeks to oh here's this grab ass nba all-star game it was a rough re-entry i didn't even know what to bat i was like the over under was like 300 i was like i mean i don't know i was like what it, well no one away. gives a shit it's got to go over yeah. i would think i was actually re-watching the last dance and i, I mean mj's last year was nba all-star mvp yeah. Like they actually cared back then. It was but cool. Sometimes when the game's tight at the end of the fourth quarter, like they actually start trying. This one was like pretty much East was running away with it. And like it, n no one ever tried. It was just like who can score? You know, you got Cat trying to score fifty, Halliburton out there jacking it every time for the hometown crowd. It's just like this is just, I don't know. Like who's watching? And all the celebs that show up for him. Like why would you show up to this one, one game in Indianapolis? All right, enough negativity. Just fix it. Just fix Mr. it Silver. and fix the DQ for the scorecard. We got all the answers here on this show. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you on next week's Subpar.